Okay, we're back with a new video. Real quick, I know I look like this today. Uh, setup is all fucked up, as you can see. Uh, but, you know, we're trying something new. With every single video, we try to evolve the content a little bit more and see how that works. If it doesn't work, whatever. Um, last video was super well prepared. This one, maybe not so much. This one's a little bit strange. But hey, I find it a little bit more interesting as well. So. Here we go. Today, boys and girls, we will be talking about our Recently, I've started getting a little bit more into architecture, primarily because I've started to realize that in many ways, and as with many other sorts of art, um, architecture sort of shapes the way that we see and react to things. You know, buildings and architectural designs in general are most of the time made to elicit feelings and reactions from the observer. Look at this building, for example. This is the Unité d'Habitation. I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm sorry if that is not how you pronounce it. This is a very particular structure. This is a very unique building that has a very unique architectural style. Well, what I, I'm trying to say by showing you this is that many different things are made in certain ways to elicit different feelings in the viewer. Today, we will be talking about one specific style, which is often said to be the ugliest in the architectural world. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we will be talking about brutalism. Yeah. That's All right, let's start with the basics. What is brutalism? Well, brutalism is an architectural style defined by very geometric, almost monolithic concrete structures. Like, picture a very utilitarian, institutionalized building, like maybe public housing. Um, which I'm sorry, Americans, you probably don't know much about that. That sort of feel is kind of what I'm trying to get at. Like, look at these examples. This is basically what I'm referring to. But why use the word brutalism for such a concept? Well, as villainous and sinister as the word may appear, um, it unfortunately is not that complex or scary. Uh, <laughs> in actuality, it comes from the French word breton bleu, which... You know, it's kind of boring. I know the French are that scary. I'm sorry for having to ruin the whole experience for you. The phrase Breton Bleu, meaning raw concrete, is said, amongst many others, because of course history couldn't just give you a straight answer, to be the first nomenclature for this type of architecture. And, you know, understandable, all the buildings are made out of concrete. <laughs> When it comes to the historic background of brutalism, the whole thing sort of started and came into full bloom in the 1950s during post-war UK reconstruction projects. And for brutalism to be set in this time period kind of makes sense if you think about it, you know, its ties with other modernist styles are very indicative or characteristic of a society which is sort of adapting in the 20th century to a very... Uh, industrialized modern uh, feel, uh, to th aesthetic, let's put it that way. As with any other styles, there is no clear inventor to it all. There's not one person who woke up one day and said, yo, I'm gonna make a brutalist building and this is what brutalism is going to be from now on. But there are a few architects that are worthy of mention, like Alison and Peter Smithsons. Now, both of them created a lot of brutalist buildings across the UK, but I wanted to mention them because of many of their buildings, like the Constantin School and the Upper Lawn Pavilion. I'm sorry, I have to read, but it's they're weird names. Were created under the label of New Brutalism. I won't go into detail about what New Brutalism is because that would take a while, but essentially they were more focused on the functionality and utilitarian feel of a place. Other architects worthy of mention, if you want to check them out, uh, are Marcel Breuer, Lina Bobardi, and Erno Goldfinger. With all this being said, many of you even slightly familiar with brutalism may be confused to hear that it started in post-war UK and not in Eastern European countries. I've seen this confusion a lot in online forums and I will admit I had the same idea. However, 
as ignorant as I may have been in the past, this idea is not completely wrong, as brutalism did in fact take a very strong hold of one specific Eastern European country, which I want to talk a little bit about, just a quick brief moment about Yugoslavia. Yes, the classic one. We all love Yugoslavia, don't we? Let's go to the thought bubble. Fuck. Yugoslavia, uh, as it was known then, of course, now it has separated and all that stuff, is a great example of how brutalism can penetrate a place. Sorry, <laughs> penetrate. God, that's probably not the best word. To understand Yugoslavic architecture and specifically brutalism, it is also important to take a little bit of a historic look at the past. Just a tiny bit, I promise. I know I like doing this and kind of dropping a lot of info with not great explanations, but I promise this will be brief and I will try to explain it as best as I can. In the years following World War II, the Yugoslav state started pursuing geo-economic as well as ideological interests that didn't necessarily match with what Stalin's Soviet Union had in mind. You know, they were kind of like looking at each other and saying, hey, I want to do this. And the other person was, mm, I don't think you should do that. They weren't directly fighting or anything, but it was, it was a bit of a tense situation. For example, Tito's expansionist goals with Albania in the Balkans that Stalin maybe didn't agree with. I would like to clarify here that when I say expansion, I don't mean it in a military forceful way, but in a political sense, meaning that Yugoslavia was almost completely integrating Albania into its own economic systems through treaties on mutual assistance and different agreements. It's also worth mentioning that Stalin's opposition to Yugoslav foreign policy did not come from the moralistic standpoint of a person who feels like the region is being robbed of its agency, but more from the perspective of someone who understands that if these agreements take place, it might impede on their own personal vision for the countries that reside in the area. Anyways, the important part of this is realizing or keeping in mind that sometime in 1948, there was a split between Stalin's Soviet Union and Tito's Yugoslavia. And what this meant is that there was now some like a midpoint between the East and the West. The relevance of this midpoint for this video being that it gave artists in Yugoslavia the opportunity to choose how they wanted to mold their architectural style, to shape it somewhat in the east or lean a little bit to the west or a mixture of both. So many artists choosing to avoid the social realism and sort of constructivist essence of Soviet architectures looked west specifically at the very modernist styles that were emerging at the time. As such, the construction of a new Yugoslavia, a sort of devoid of Soviet influence, although it was still heavily influenced by the Soviet Union, became like a massive modernist reconstruction project. So this trend kind of spread all over the place, and even after the dissolution of Yugoslavia, you could see a lot of brutalism architectural buildings and things of that sort, which were influenced by many Yugoslav artists who chose to stick to modernism in this time period. This being said, there are still one point here left and answered, which is the main sort of topic of this video that I even haven't touched upon, uh, which is kind of weird, I should probably have done that earlier, but that is, why is brutalism so hated? I personally think that the issue and distaste most people have towards brutalism is that it just isn't approachable. If anything, it is more apprehensive than your normal run-of-the-mill building. Let's look at this building, for example. This is the Sesc Pompeia in Brazil. What words come to mind when looking at this building? Cold? Empty? Desolate, maybe? Well, how about this one? This is Mary Arden's farm. Very cozy, friendly, and approachable, right? The concrete, heavy structures matched with the highly geometric and often very rough 
shapes it makes everything very intimidating and uh, kind of oppressive it's it's very very tough to describe but it kind of pushes people away looking back at the cesc pompeia we talked about earlier we see the staples of brutalism here we can find very deep and desolate passages matched with very eroded and worn concrete and all of this matched with big sag holes in the walls how is this supposed to be you know a homely place to people it just isn't it appears very hostile and very apprehensive to an outsider now let's also look at the Arden farm now this this is the definition of homely and approachable and nice this is very old english villagey type of architecture very tutory which we've seen all over the place but make the entire house or the entire area um for that matter very very approachable and very nice to come back to it kind of feels like your grandma's house imagine you were going to grandma's house on the weekend to maybe eat supper would you rather go to this massive concrete building or this nice little village house. By all this, I don't mean to say that all forms of brutalism fall short in making buildings appealing, but what I am trying to say is that when it comes to people's estate, apprehensibility is what I see to be the main issue or the root of the issue to begin with. They just don't find the buildings approachable or nice for the area where they live. They prefer things which look a bit nicer and less raw and rough, if that makes sense. In any ways, we've talked a lot about different things, but to finalize this video, I want to make a quick social experiment using all of you as lab rats. So, what am I talking about? What I want to do here with my little experiment is to see if one can change their perspective on brutalism through sheer exposure and difference of view. The way I see it, to truly enjoy brutalism or to enjoy most brutalist architecture, what you need to do first is hate it. Let's take a look at two buildings. The first one here is the Boston City Hall. Ugly, right? Not very appealing, not very nice. Let's take a look at this one. This is Habitat 67. A lot better, right? You may have liked the first one or the second one more or none at all even, but that doesn't really matter. What is truly essential here is one key word, style. In my humble opinion, the most important aspect to grasp if you wish to enjoy brutalism or any other art form for that matter, is that style is everything. You know, some forms of brutalism might make you sick, others weirdly comfortable. It really all depends on your point of view. Brutalism, as established of a concept as it may be, is still an ever-changing phenomena. So if you maybe don't like certain things, you could change them. As long as they still conform with what defines brutalism, it still is brutalist. Of course, I am not saying you need to enjoy brutalism. You may not like any form of brutalist architecture, and I'm not here acting like a film snob telling you, you must enjoy this or else you're... You haven't seen it or, or or something like that okay you could just not enjoy it but if you're a bit confused on whether you truly like it or you don't then maybe looking at different styles and different buildings will help create in your mind a better picture of what brutalism truly is and in case ladies and gentlemen that has been it for today's video if you enjoyed it drop a like down below if you have any video ideas that you want me to do or talk about also drop them in the comments and i will see you all in the next one peace